welcome colleagues and guests to the second in this year's series of public lectures presented by the School of the Arts at the University of Liverpool. My name is Peter Buse and I'm the Dean of the School. This is the third year of the lecture series in which we showcase the research of the school to wider academic and non-academic audiences, both inside and outside the university. Each of the school's five disciplines is represented in this series, which runs this year from March to May and takes as its guiding title, Word Image Power. Last week, Richard Coeck from Architecture talked about the history of immersive experiences. And after Easter, we will hear from Simran Singh from the music department, Rachel Wiseman from philosophy, and Will Slocum from English. Our speakers won't necessarily address all three terms in our series title, but they will often use one or two of them as a springboard for thought. And they are certainly relevant for this evening's lecture by Patricia Rossini from the Department of Communication and Media. With a bit of luck, our fourth series next year will, will be back on campus where a speaker and audience can share the same space and we can provide some hospitality for all afterwards. For now though, we remain safely online and in the future, I expect we will have some mix of in-person and online because we are now reaching a much wider audience with these talks. Last week for Professor Coex's lecture, we had people logging in from 30 different countries around the world. And I know that many of you today will have logged in from Brazil, from the United States and from Canada. So to guests in the UK, good evening, and to those of you on the other side of the Atlantic, good afternoon, or even good morning. You're all very welcome. So I'll say a little bit about the format of the talk. Patricia will be speaking for about 35 minutes, and after that, she'll be taking questions from you in the audience. As you will know, because you've already had a prompt, this lecture is being recorded and will be made available on the university website afterwards. The chat function will be open throughout, but if you want to ask questions of Patricia, we ask that you enter them under the Q&A section rather than in the chat where it's harder for us to keep track of them. So moving on now to the main event, I'm really delighted to present to you today, Dr. Patricia Rossini. Patricia is a Darby Fellow in the Department of Communication and Media in the School of the Arts. Prior to joining us, she was a postdoctoral research fellow in the School of Information Studies at Syracuse University in New York. She has a PhD in communication from the Federal University of Minas Gerais, Brazil. Broadly speaking, her research is concentrated on the impact of social media in politics and democracy. Specifically, she studies informal political talk online with an emphasis on incivility and intolerance and the ways in which these behaviors may be democratically harmful. She's also interested in computational social sciences and is currently working on developing algorithms to measure strategic communication and political discussion online. Her work has been published by New Media and Society, Communication Research, Social Media and Society, the International Journal of Communication, the Journal of Information Technology and Politics, and the Journal of Deliberative Democracy. Patricia is currently working on five externally funded projects. She's the lead investigator in a grant awarded by Facebook to investigate perceptions of uncivil and intolerant discourse online in four countries and on a project to study the use of private messaging apps and social media as sources for political misinformation funded by WhatsApp. She's a co-lead investigator on a project funded by Twitter to investigate conversational dynamics and develop metrics to detect polarization, incivility and intolerance in discussions around contentious and non-contentious topics. Also co-lead investigator of a comparative research project funded by Facebook to study visual misinformation on social media in eight countries across five continents, and also co-lead investigator on a project analyzing political advertising on Facebook in the 2020 elections in the United States, supported by the Knight Foundation. So as you can tell from her title, her talk today emerges from some of these projects. So Patricia, over to you. Hi, thanks everyone. Uh, thanks Peter for the lovely introduction and thanks to everyone who is here today. Uh, unfortunately, we're not in the same space. I haven't left this room in a year, feels like, um, but hopefully soon we're all gonna be uh, able to see each other again and I'll actually be able to see people, not through my screen. But as uh, Peter rightfully mentioned, the silver lining is that we can then have these talks with much broader audiences and it's, um, very lovely to see uh, many known names and many unknown names uh, in the list of participants. Um, so I am very excited about this talk. Uh, before we start, I also would like to thank um, Dr. Helen Thomas, uh, our public engagement officer who has done a lot to publicize this talk uh, and also to make it 
reach audiences that I wasn't even I wasn't even aware of. So um, thanks to Helen as well for helping organize this. Um, yeah, let's do it. Let me share my screen. And I'll apologize up front for um, some background noises, me, because there's a dog. There might also be barking. We never know with these things, do we? All right. Um, do you see the right version of my PowerPoint? Full version. Anyone just say yes. Yes. Yeah, perfect. OK. All right, so um, today I'm going to talk about um, how complicated, difficult, sometimes heated, and perhaps uncivil conversations that uh, take place on social media, but also on private messaging apps might have um, potentially detrimental effects for personal relationships. So uh, really looking at the extent to which people uh, block, unfriend, cut personal ties, or even leave social media uh, for reasons associated to politics, and in particular, uh, for reasons associated with um, experiencing negative conversations or negative emotions deriving from conversations in these environments. Just for a bit of a background, um, for those of us who have been studying um, politics and the internet for um, at least a decade or two, um, we've been going through a roller coaster ride, uh, right? Uh, a couple of decades ago, we were all so full of hope and optimism. We felt like um, the internet and social media overall would just kind of like tap, fill all the holes that democracy was, uh, democracy had, and it would uh, help increase participation, providing multiple venues for participation, but also uh, provide multiple venues for people to engage in politics and political discussion. And um, also importantly, would not only uh, increase access, but also diversify access to information, not only because uh, information runs free and it's you know using the internet you can access multiple sources but also because multiple voices could then become uh, the producers of such information. Though a couple of decades in um, reality hit hard uh, and we're now kind of shifting to looking a bit more at the potentially detrimental um, effects or consequences uh, or even situations and, and contexts that we um, that come with our increasingly online lives. Um, so for sure, even though we have increased opportunities for participation, we also have um, increased uh, evidence uh, that some of these participation is leading to polarization. Even though there are indeed multiple venues for political discussion, a lot of those discussions um, are full of incivility and sometimes intolerance harassment, right? And even though it is true that we now have access to uh, more venues and more sources for information, it is also true that this complicates the, the scenario quite a lot. And we are also exposed to a ton of disinformation, misinformation, and propaganda. So um, things haven't been as bright as we once thought they would be, right? But at least uh, in terms of social media and politics, which uh, has been uh, at the forefront of the internet and politics research agenda, at least for a decade now, um, actually, God, more than a decade, um, are we old? Um, we have some kind of consistent evidence that social media use is typically associated with uh, a set of positive democratic outcomes. So for instance, by increasing um, access to and opportunities for political participation, that being online or offline. Um, we also know that the people who use social media more frequently are also likely to be exposed to political news and political information, even if they're not looking for it, which um, is again, um, kind of a beneficial outcome. Uh, we know that people who use social media um, have more opportunities for political discussion and also are likely to be exposed to political disagreement, to cost-cutting views or um, oppo uh, opposing views, right? Which is all to say that some of those um, kind of early on alarmist views that social media and social media algorithms would lead us all to uh, echo chambers and filtered bubbles have been quite consistently refuted by the literature um, and research in US, across Europe, um, just pretty much everywhere, comparative, single case, you name it. Um, most uh, of the evidence that we have is that no, actually social media tends to, to give us more information, more opportunities for engagement and overall kind of good things. 
But not always, um, right? There is also some evidence that because of the heightened level of polarization that we live today um, in countries like the United States, uh, even in Britain or, or Brazil, which is a topic of my talk, um, there is some evidence that this uh, heightened level of polarization could potentially undermine some of these benefits. For instance, um, Pew uh, Internet Research study uh, last year um, in the United States showed that uh, the vast majority of Americans felt worn out by political discussions that happen online and an overwhelming majority, so 70%, said that it was actually stressful and frustrating to interact with people they disagree with. And in this context then, uh, it is worth investigating whether um, these situations, these feelings that, you know, seeing disagreement all the time is exhausting, but also it's so stressful and frustrating to talk to people who think differently than us, um, right? If whether these leads to politically motivated uh, selective avoidance, which has been deemed by prior research, should we stop, sorry, uh, as a relatively rare behavior. Huh, why does it matter, uh, right? Social media platforms today kind of feel sometimes like a dumpster fire. Right, you have to see um, a bunch of opinions that you may not necessarily agree with. And uh, part of the reason why it matters is that um, if instead of seeing opposing views, people start turning away from it, then uh, we might in fact uh, go back to that, those um, alarming views, right? That given the choice, we will choose to shield ourselves from everything that disagrees and everyone who disagrees with us which would then lead us to echo chambers and political intolerance. So if, if conversation is at the heart of, uh, of democracy and democratic societies, which is somewhat consensual view, both by uh, those who abide to deliberative um, democratic theories, but also participatory de democratic theories, if there is no conversation uh, across you know, opposing sides, then it is very difficult to foster, uh, well, first to heal divisions, but also to foster uh, an environment and a context where we can talk through our divisions, bridge our divisions, and find, even if provisional, some consensus on what things should look like and how the world should be, right? So uh, in, in extreme cases, then, selective avoidance could lead us to enclose ourselves into echo chambers, and in those situations, we do know uh, there is substantive evidence to suggest that the less we interact with the other side, the less, the less we see the other side and understand the other side and consider the other side to be legitimate and to hold legitimate views, then the more polarized that we become and the more intolerant we become towards the other side. So, um, uh, which then in turn means that we don't see the other side as you know, people who are entitled to have their own opinions that are just different than ours, but actually we see them as a threat and as a threat that should be fought and combated at, like by any means necessary. So what do we know um, about selective avoidance, uh, which is again, these act of like selectively shooting yourself from a uh, content and opinion that you disagree with. Um, first, uh, research across several countries and contexts and cultures um, has suggested that selective avoidance is relatively rare, uh, and that is looking mainly at social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter. And this work has primarily looked at selective avoidance as a mechanism or as, or as the act of user filtration, right? So this idea that because social media platforms kind of allow us to determine what we want to see and what we don't want to see, then if we are seeing a lot of things that we don't want to see, we would then actively remove those people, either those being friends or people we follow on, on, on Twitter, um, whatever, right? Um, what we know though for, from the research that um, is already out there, uh, mainly about Facebook and Twitter is that Frequent political discussion on social media tends to be a predictor, a positive predictor of uh, selective avoidance. So people who talk about politics a lot might be more likely to engage in avoidance. We know that political discussion with weak social ties, so people who you don't know very well and people who are not a very you know, important part of your life um, can lead to selective avoidance. 
We also know that having larger social networks overall on social media, like Facebook, right? Like you're collecting friends for, for a decade. So you have 600, you know, one more, one less. What does it matter? This tends to uh, lead people to filter a bit more, uh, but also seeing political, uh, political posts uh, frequently. There's also some evidence that other than these kind of contextual uh, things that you see on social media um, and also behavioral factors uh, are influential, some personal traits might also explain why people engage in such behaviors with one of them being strong partisanship. So people who are very strongly connected and, and identify, should we stop with, um, uh, sorry, he just got a squeaker. Um, so it's, sorry. Give me a second. Sorry, um, dogs don't like Zoom today. Right, so strong partisanship, people who strongly identify as partisan are less likely to tolerate the other side and more likely than to filter out. But also um, some evidence, at least in the US, that being male and also being older would lead you to selectively avoid others. What else? Um, these studies have mostly been single platforms, so looking either at Facebook or on Twitter. And at least in terms of cross-cutting exposure, so being exposed to opinions that you don't like, that you disagree with, um, results are quite inconsistent. Some people find that exposure to disagreement leads to selective avoidance. So some people find no, that no, it doesn't, uh, or that the results are not, um, are not significant. So question still out there if what leads us to selectively avoid is actually just exposure to disagreement. There is some evidence that people who perceive conversations on social media to be uncivil, to be uncomfortable and to be very negative, um, can start to selectively, selectively avoid on social media. But so far, at least uh, not to my knowledge or not that has been published, um, researchers haven't, haven't really considered how platform differences, and particularly when we talk about more public versus private settings, can affect people's experiences and behaviors in terms of avoiding political content uh, and avoiding even uh, social connections for reasons related to politics. Um, finally, we also know um, that uh, being on the other side of avoidance is not great. Um, so people who have been unfriended by others uh, with whom they have close ties tend to see this as a pretty negative violation of expectations, right? So if you know that a friend of yours decided to unfriend you, uh, that's not great. Uh, and also we know that because of that, um, people tend to avoid sanctioning others because they don't wanna lose contact or suffer the potentially negative consequences in terms of both affection and strength of relationships by doing so. So much related to um, you know, research in the 2000s, for instance, by uh, Diana Mutz, which suggested that people would avoid disagreement in their most, uh, in their closest and more personal interactions because they didn't want to um, harm the relationship based on political differences. Um, there is some suggestion that similar dynamics would be in place because you know uh, you might have political disagreements with someone, but you don't necessarily want to undermine a relationship because of that, which would be then a reason for avoidance not to happen in more private uh, spaces or with people with whom um, you have closer relationships. Um, but on, when we talk about private messaging apps like WhatsApp, then it's not really about user filtration. Like you're not building a feed. There's no feed of, um, of things that other people are posting, right? You're talking to a couple of other people in, uh, in group chats, or you're talking to one more person in a set of, of chats, right? So it's it's a completely different um, setup for avoiding political content or avoiding conversations for political reasons. And in that content, uh, in that context, sorry, uh, my colleagues and I um, have been discussing how this is not really selective avoidance. It actually is kind of a social sanction, right? If you start severing ties, cutting ties with other people because of what they say and because of conversations that you experience or for any other politically motivated um, reason, then you are sanctioning them uh, because you perceive either that they are violating some norms, right? Um, or because you're directly showing them that you know you don't want that conversation and actually you're willing to walk away, right? Um, and the main reason for, for that, well, the two reasons for that is that first, um, the nature of social relationships that we maintain in private messaging apps 
is remarkably different in general than those that we maintain uh, in large social networking sites, such as, for instance, Facebook, right? Uh, for most of us in this call, the ones uh, who still have a Facebook account, because it's, it's, it's a lot of people are now deleting it. Like we've been collecting people on Facebook for like, what, 10 years, 15, right? So you have like a couple hundred or more than a couple hundred people that have been there forever, uh, right? So you have people with whom you talk to, people with whom you really don't, people with whom you went to school with, like, you know, 20 years ago, they're just all there, right? So what that means is that even though you might not interact with those people all the time, you do have a lot more weak ties on your public social networking sites. And on when we look at like messaging apps like WhatsApp, or even if you were talking about Facebook Messenger, uh, no, not really, right? The people with whom you talk on a more regular basis, particularly on private messaging apps, which imply that you have um, someone else's phone number, these are people who are um, in general closer to you, right? People who are in general uh, more meaningful relationships or stronger relationships. Um, and the second thing is that in these contexts, so the context of uh, private messaging apps, um, it's not really uh, um, selective avoidance or user filtration because all these things are actually very visible. They are actually very um, easy to notice, right? If you simply stop talking to someone after they you know, offended you or something, they are probably gonna notice. Uh, if you are in a group discussion and you just decide to leave, actually everyone is gonna notice because everyone is notified. Whereas when you are in a platform like Facebook, you know, if you choose to hide someone or to block someone or even to unfriend someone, they're not gonna be notified. Uh, most likely they won't even ever notice unless they are really co close friends, right? So completely different um, settings. And because of these different affordances and even the different connections that we maintain when we think about um, more public social media um, websites versus um, places like um, WhatsApp or Telegram or whichever um, app you wanna use since WhatsApp's now uh, down in popularity, um, is that you know, there are important forces that matter. So first, right, we are talking primarily about one-to-one -one or one-to-few people conversation and group chats. So kind of know who is there versus uh, on social network sites um, like Facebook, public feeds, right? Everyone posts, you see a creation of stuff that everyone posted, not necessarily things that are directed at you or that presume you as the audience. Which means that then, you know, while on messaging apps, we have quite a well um, reasoned control of who is the audience for everything that we say and who is the audience in any given group. Uh, on Facebook, you have this higher risk of context collapse, right? You post something, you don't really know who's gonna see it. Sometimes it will travel far and wide uh, and you're gonna have to deal with consequences and et cetera. And, and lastly, while we are talking you know, on the one hand about kind of private and encrypted communication uh, on platforms like Facebook, not only um, discussions are kind of visible um, and, and out there, but also they are visible to your peers. So, you know, um, people who are connected to you might also see what and how you are talking to someone else. And those affordances, um, I think, probably matter. Uh, but also in terms of visibility, as I was saying before, um, sanctions on, on WhatsApp, so leaving a group or stop talking to someone and et cetera, are very visible and very easy to perceive, right? While unfriending, blocking, or hiding people on Facebook uh, are relatively invisible to the target, right? Like if you're actually just hiding content of those family members who say horrible things, they will never know, like ever. So it's quite different. Um, Part of the reason why we care about WhatsApp in Brazil is that WhatsApp is nearly installed in any in every smartphone that has uh, internet connection. Um, Brazil has roughly um, three fourths of the population online, uh, and what that means is that it's uh, the second largest Western country in terms of internet users and the third in the global South, only behind uh, India and Indonesia. Um, of the Brazilian users uh, who are online, uh, about 99% uh, use the internet with mobile devices and actually a majority, so 58% are mobile only users. Um, 
which then can really help explain and understand the prominence and centrality of WhatsApp, not only in politics, but really in business and everything uh, Brazilians do. Um, WhatsApp in terms of users, uh, although this data is a bit outdated because WhatsApp doesn't really disclose that very often. Um, so I think this is 2017, um, is sh very shortly behind Facebook uh, with just 7 million uh, fewer users than Facebook. And th that means that these are the two most prominent, most used uh, social media platforms um, in Brazil. And there has been increased attention to the role of WhatsApp uh, and politics and its connection to politics in Brazil, at least since 2018. So uh, unless you've been living under a rock, you've probably seen uh, international reports on the New York Times or Washington Post or The Guardian or even the BBC about um, you know, the spread of misinformation and political misinformation uh, during the elections in 2018 and how WhatsApp, mo much more than Facebook or Twitter or whatever, was the place where these things were circulating. Um, now research in Brazil about COVID uh, and COVID relation, uh, sorry, COVID related misinformation has also been turning to WhatsApp because it's just where people are, it's just where things go. And even if you look at uh, data by the digital news reports, the Oxford uh, Reuters digital news report, uh, Brazilians use WhatsApp for news just at about the same rate that they use Facebook for news. So WhatsApp is quite, quite, quite central. But the research looking at WhatsApp use in Brazil uh, has mostly been looking at um, two venues. One, public or large discussion groups about politics, which um, are not really representative of most users' experiences. Right, so um, you have this gigantic groups with hundreds of participants that have the goal of discussing politics and they are public, meaning that researchers can then look at the content of those conversations, which is not possible for those more personal private uh, conversations. And also the focus has been almost exclusively on misinformation, disinformation and propaganda. But um, as part of this, this research project um, and WhatsApp users ourselves uh, during a very heated election in 2018, we had very strong feelings that it's not only, the problem is not only misinformation, it's really like how conversations happen and what people say and the extent to which you are connected to people that you might not want to uh, break relationships with, but also you don't like what they're saying, like how hard it is to navigate this, this environment. Um, as uh, said, like polarization in Brazil is, um, I guess, at unprecedented levels. Uh, Bolsonaro's victory in 2018 um, was the reflection of this deeply polarized country, but that was not um, the start of it. Uh, we can cite the uprisings, the public uprisings of 2013 as perhaps the start of this deepening of the polarization in Brazil. And then we had very contested heated elections in 2014 electing Dilma Rousseff with a very, very narrow margin, which almost instantly led to more uprisings in 15 and an impeachment process that was more of a parliamentary coup because there was no actual grounds for impeachment in 2016. So like things have been going in a downward spiral for almost a decade now, it's quite bad. Um, uh, an Ipsos poll in 2019 said, uh, suggested that Brazil was the third most politically polarized country among 27 nations, uh, being only behind South Africa and India. And uh, in the same poll, uh, poll, they show that a third of the population said it was just not worth talking about politics with people that hold different opinions. Right? So it's not, not only we're pretty badly polarized, but also we are going to continue to do so because a third of the population doesn't really want to know what the other side has to say. So um, for the Brazilians in the audience, right, like the old saying that uh, we should avoid talking about politics, football or religion over dinner, it's a thing of the past and like sometimes I kind of miss it. Um, so thinking about what we know, uh, a couple of hypotheses and research questions, right? Um, if Thai strength, so like if the strength of your relationship with other people um, has been found to be a predictor of selective avoidance, um, one of the expectations then is that be blocking others or cutting social ties would be more likely to happen on Facebook where we have a bunch of people that we don't necessarily care about than on WhatsApp where we talk to people who are kind of closer to us in general, right? Um, so that's a hypothesis number one. Um, also, because people tend to be more tolerant towards um, diverging views from those who they already like, um, 
we expected that this agreement would be associated with cutting ties or blocking others on Facebook, but not on WhatsApp, right? People are like, it's okay if they have different opinions, I guess. Um, thinking about polarization and the relationship with social sanctions, we um, hypothesize, uh, and I say we, because this is a collective project, um, that politically extreme users would be more likely to block or cut social ties because of political content on Facebook than on what, um, sorry, on Facebook and on WhatsApp. Uh, but we also asked a uh, different, a bit more extreme kind of reaction, which is uh, whether extremely political, uh, politically extreme users uh, would be more likely to quit Facebook altogether, just like done with this, uh, and also to quit WhatsApp groups, WhatsApp discussion groups. And then we turn our attention uh, to kind of heated, contested, and potentially uncivil discussions. So we look at whether um, having uncivil interactions, so when people perceive that they are being either offended or attacked in a conversation, uh, increases the likelihood of blocking or cutting social ties in both platforms. Um, we imagine that those discussions might actually affect people a bit more when they happen with close social ties. And therefore they would be likely to increase the odds of blocking or cutting ties on Facebook a bit more, sorry, on WhatsApp a bit more than on Facebook. And we asked the question of whether this would also uh, increase the likelihood of quitting WhatsApp groups. So for the methods, uh, we did a large online survey uh, with a representative um, sample based on quotas for age, gender, education, and region in Brazil. We combine an online panel with phone-based interviews because um, as I said before, uh, a good part of the population is mobile only user. Uh, and then also if you are stratified by education and region and age for internet users, it's very hard to find lower educated and older people sometimes um, on online panels only. So we supplemented our sample with phone interviews. Um, the main variables we're looking at are blocking and cutting social ties for political reasons uh, on both platforms. Um, so two there, uh, quitting Facebook and also quitting WhatsApp groups. And the main independent variables are frequency of political talk, these agreement, uh, political extremity, having heated conversations, being offended or being attacked. Uh, as well as demographics. Um, this is just the question worthy, uh, but I'm not gonna stop here. Uh, but again, like we're just asking this in the past six months, did this, the, any of these things happen to you? So did you block or stop talking to, you know, for Facebook users, unfriended someone for reasons related to politics, or did you exclude your Facebook account, or did you quit a group for disagreeing with other participants' opinions uh, for WhatsApp only? And uh, in terms of like the uncivil and heated conversations, um, heated conversations, we just asked like, did you participate in a polemic or heated political discussion on Facebook and on WhatsApp? So a question per, uh, per platform. We asked if people had felt offended by someone else during a political discussion. And also we asked if people had been attacked uh, during a political discussion, again, for both platforms. Um, this is just a basic uh, distribution of our um, sample, so quite balanced by gender, um, then education and age. Uh, and what I want to highlight in this slide uh, is just that the vast majority of our, our participants are not only very frequent uh, WhatsApp and Facebook users, but actually they are using these platforms um, most of the time more than once a day. So like very, very intense use. So first, um, let's look at blocking or cutting um, social ties, um, right? We had this hypothesis that this would happen a bit more on Facebook where these things are uh, virtually invisible for the recipients versus on WhatsApp. And that is actually not true. So as you can see in these like <laughs> two rectangles of basically the same height, um, we have no significant differences. Uh, basically one in four of our respondents has blocked or cut ties with someone in um, either platform. No differences there. Uh, when it comes to quitting uh, WhatsApp groups and quitting Facebook, uh, perhaps not very surprising, like not a lot of people quit Facebook over this, uh, but 10% is perhaps <clears throat> substantial, <clears throat> sorry. Um, and about 23% of our sample said that actually they have quit uh, WhatsApp groups for reasons related to politics. <clears throat> 
in terms of the key independent variables, um, we can see that we only really find differences between like people perceptions of heated discussions with people saying that they have participated in heated discussions slightly more frequently uh, on WhatsApp than they have done on Facebook, which perhaps makes sense since you know, on WhatsApp, most of your interactions are actual conversations or discussions versus you know Facebook, not necessarily so. Um, but uh, pretty similar uh, proportions when we look at people who felt personally attacked um, or felt offended um, by someone else during a discussion. Now, I'm um, just going to show you a plot of uh, regression coefficients. Um, everything that is to the right side of the dotted line is a significant coefficient. Everything that is to the left side is a negative coefficient. Here, um, we look at first political extremes. So people who are either identifying themselves as being extremely to the left or extremely to the right are more likely to engage in, in, in blocking and cutting ties both on Facebook and on WhatsApp. So no platform differences there. Um, sorry, before we do that, um, we don't see anything for political discussion, right? So political discussion, um, the coefficients are over, overlapping. Um, the midline, which means not significant. Then if we look at uh, cross-cutting exposure, and I can't see the legend, okay, Facebook is, um, Facebook is orange. Um, cross-cutting exposure is a predictor for Facebook, but not necessarily for WhatsApp, which you know, maybe people are indeed a bit more tolerant to diverging views among their friends. But then if we look at um, the uncivil conversations, right? Feeling offended in a discussion or actually being personally attacked in a discussion, those seem to be quite strongly associated with uh, blocking uh, behaviors, unfriending behaviors, and just cutting social ties in general. However, um, engaging in heated conversations um, is not so much so for Facebook, but it is on WhatsApp. So uh, WhatsApp users perceive that perhaps as a more of a norm violation than, than Facebook users do. Um, and participating in political WhatsApp groups, so groups on WhatsApp where you discuss and see information about politics is negatively associated with this. So it could be the case that you know, people who talk more and, and, and just participate more in these environments are a bit more uh, tolerant um, to, to what happens there. Um, just some predicted probabilities to show the sizes of these effects, um, right? So here, uh, what, zero means no, uh, I, haven't, I haven't been attacked, and one means yes, I have been, and same for heated talk and the same for being offended. We can see that both for attacks and for feeling offended, uh, the coefficients are quite high, right? Like someone who said that they um, felt offended uh, in a Facebook discussion are about 40% more likely to um, actually block someone or cut social ties. And a bit less so, so about 35-ish you know, percent uh, more likely to do so on WhatsApp um, and a bit of a similar scenario for uh, attacks with a bit more for WhatsApp than it is on Facebook. Um, not so much so for heated talk, right? Heated talk, not necessarily a big deal um, for, um, for people to, to change their behaviors. Uh, and lastly, looking at quitting Facebook and quitting WhatsApp groups, um, Right, so here Facebook is red and uh, WhatsApp is blue, which is confusing, and I wish I had seen that before. Um, we don't see much here for politically extreme folks, so they don't care, they don't quit. Um, Cross-cutting exposure uh, is a bit significant for Facebook um, use, but not necessarily for quitting WhatsApp groups. And then uh, the, same, the same relationships for feeling offended or personally attacked, right? Uh, these are both uh, positive predictors of quitting Facebook altogether or leaving WhatsApp groups for reasons related to politics. Um, similarly to the other one, uh, heated discussions don't seem to matter that much, um, neither for WhatsApp nor for Facebook. WhatsApp groups uh, about politics don't really seem to matter, uh, neither uh, to the demographic characteristics. So just to sum it up, because it feels like there's a lot going on, um, the first hypothesis that we had was about differences between um, these two platforms, at least for blocking and cutting social ties. We did not find differences. People 
cut ties. They don't care uh, if it's with close WhatsApp friends or with distanced Facebook friends, it's fine. Um, we found that cross-cutting exposure was only a predictor of social sanctions on Facebook, which is perhaps, you know, silver lining that we tend to tolerate more disagreement uh, if we are talking to people that we care and like um, a bit more, right? Uh, we also confirmed that partisans are more likely to engage in those sanctions or selective avoidance behaviors, um, cutting ties for reasons related to politics in both platforms uh, with a stronger effect on WhatsApp than we did see on Facebook. Um, we found that uncivil conversations, so conversations where people feel either offended or attacked, were positively and quite strongly associated with blocking behaviors on both platforms. Uh, should we stop? Uh, but also that heated discussions were positively associated with cutting ties and blocking on WhatsApp, but not on Facebook. Uh, so what do we know then? Um, first, that in Brazil, selective avoidance or social sanctions are becoming quite normalized. Uh, that happens across platforms, and that is in spite of differences in both network size or tie strength. So people don't really seem to care if they're cutting ties with um, close friends or family members, or if they're cutting ties with people they met 20 years ago. They're just doing it. Um, and that is particularly the case for extreme partisans, which then in turn might raise some concerns that um, social media and WhatsApp and all the discussions that take place in these two environments may actually further contribute to polarize partisans. So uh, even though for most people or for the general population, those are not um, echo chambers, those are not places of extreme views, for people who are already kind of polarized, um, they might actually become further polarized because they are more likely to start creating um, their own feeds and actually selectively avoiding those with whom they disagree. <clears throat> um, exposure to cross-cutting views, so exposure to political difference, um, was only a predictor on Facebook, which again, as I think I already uh, mentioned, might suggest that tie strength could foster confrontation instead of conflict avoidance, right? Like when we disagree with people we like, we trust, and we chat a lot, um, we might actually be able to survive that disagreement and talk through it instead of just say like, bye, right? Um, heated discussions, um, so having discussions that you perceive to be confrontational and heated uh, were associated with blocking and cutting social ties on Facebook, but not on WhatsApp, which in turn um, kind of suggests, you know, if we contrast that with a finding on cross-cutting views, that it's not really the disagreement that's the problem, but really the tone of confrontation that actually has the potential to undermine uh, more personal relationships, right? Because we're talking about WhatsApp, so people you talk to more frequently. Um, on civil interactions were quite strongly associated with avoidance and sanctions and also with more extreme actions. Um, and we also find, and I think this is relevant, especially because uh, research in Brazil and WhatsApp use in Brazil has, should we stop, uh, primarily focused on um, WhatsApp groups. Um, people who are in these spaces are actually quite uh, significantly less likely to sanction, which uh, could indicate you know, a couple of things. It could be just that they participate in groups that are kind of politically homogeneous. So they don't need to, to cut ties. They don't need to shut them down because they already think what they think. But also it could be that they are full of uh, weak ties from who participants are just less likely to take offense. Um, what this kind of means is just like, this is not good, um, right? This is the bad place. Um, if, if people um, who are participating um, in polarized political environments are actually becoming less tolerant towards confrontation, even when confrontation takes place uh, with personal relationships because they might experience negative feelings, what, what that means is that they might be turning away from political disagreement, which then in turn could lead them to be <clears throat> in echo chambers. Um, and, and you know, basically severing ties with political difference. And um, this is particularly um, concerning, I think, because we find stronger effects in private settings, in the private setting of WhatsApp, where like most people are talking to people they know and people with whom they have reasons to be interacting to more often, right? So it is 
really among your closest ties, your private like personal v ties, that these situations are problematic, which, which then in turn means that, you know, maybe having all these opportunities for political conversation and political expression is undermining pre-existing relationships and sometimes relationships that might be, um, you know, quite important to you, you know, raise, raise a hand who hasn't fought with a family member in the last year, I cannot raise that hand, right? Um, anyway, um, this study is obviously far from perfect. Uh, we have to remember that this is always uh, just cross-sectional survey data, so relationships are not causal. Um, it's not like this particular bad conversation led you to quit. We don't know. Um, these are also self-reported measures for the sole nature of being a survey. Uh, this is a single country study, um, and we could replicate some of these findings, especially for Facebook, with a U.S. sample. Um, we, we are doing that. Uh, and also, we didn't really measure, because um, it was kind of not the purpose of the study uh, on civil conversations, but we didn't really measure psychological traits that uh, we now know can also affect how people perce perceive and react to incivility. So um, for instance, we know uh, from work by Emily Sidner that uh, people who are conflict oriented who kind of enjoy heated conversations and civility is kind of fun. It's entertaining, right? But for some other people who kind of like to avoid conflict, those things completely turn you off. So we didn't measure these uh, psychological traits and we don't know um, the extent to which they would be um, taking place here. <sighs> I think I talked for like ever. Um, so thank you for listening. Uh, I hope this wasn't too boring. Chewie is definitely ready for me to stop talking and start barking. Um, before I shut up, um, I'll say that this project was funded by WhatsApp through uh, Misinformation and Social Science Research Awards. And also, uh, even though I get to be here and, and talk to you today, well, here in my room, but sure, uh, you know, talk to you today in this public lecture, this work uh, and the research uh, that is underneath is in collaboration with uh, Professor Jennifer Stromagalli at Syracuse University, uh, Vanessa Vega de Oliveira, and Erika Batista at the Federal University of Minas Gerais. So without them, I would not be here. Thank you. Uh, well, round of applause. Uh, thanks, thanks so much, uh, Patricia, for this really excellent and important uh, talk you, you've just given um, for us. I'll remind um, our audience that they can pop questions for you in the in the Q and A, and I can see that they're. I don't know if you can see them, but I will. I will read them out um, as they they come up. Um, and uh, there's there's some in the chat as as well. So we'll come to those in a in a in a second. Um, Patithi, I just want to say how much I enjoyed um, your 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 talk, and you you actually came to my question right at the right at the end when you talked about conflict orientation because. You used a metaphor, um, which I love, which we don't hear so much in the in the UK, which was a uh, dumpster fire. It's just a it's just a great it's a great image uh, for me, the dumpster fire. And and we don't we don't use it so much over here. Um, so the dumpster fire, you know, it's everything's gone wrong. You know, it's all garbage and it's, you know, a light. That's that that's the image. And for some people, that's a disaster and they want to turn away from it. But but for others, the dumpster fire carries, you know, a great it's sort of urban entertainment, isn't it? You know, it's a back alley in a, in a big city kind of, kind of thing. I don't want to stretch the metaphor too far, but, but I guess I'm what I'm trying to get at is, is precisely, you're, you're thinking particularly about avoidance um, here, but how would one go about studying the, the seeking it out that you implied, you, you, know, you suggested at the end in relationship to conflict orientation? Is there a way that one could, could study that as, as well, the high that people seem to get off the dumpster fire? Yeah, um, thanks. That's, yeah, I think that's a, actually, it is a great metaphor. And I, I didn't think about it in the, in the, on the flip side, like the entertaining way. I actually have a dumpster fire badge here of honor that uh, Jenny Surigali sent to me as a gift for surviving 2010, I guess. But it's a 2020 dumpster fire. So that's why the metaphor is always like in my head. Um, yeah, so um, there are ways, I actually think that this type of work could benefit a lot from uh, more qualitative work and focus groups perhaps um, that are about um, trying to understand both like why people turn away from conflict and from these conflictuous discussions and also what, what people perceive to be very offensive to them, what are the types of offenses, what are the types of attacks that actually make you turn away, but also why some people love it, um, right? And the work that I mentioned by uh, Emily Sidner 
uh, and it, it's in the US, so looking at US samples, but goes in depth as showing how, you know, while for some people with uh, some specific psychological traits and her focus is more on conflict avoidance and conflict orientation, but for some people, instability is a lot of fun. So like the more uh, conflict, the merrier. Um, Right, you love the fight and you, you want to see blood. Uh, but for a lot of people, that's actually a complete deterrent from politics. So if, if you're like, if those are the discussions we're going to have, I just don't want to talk and then I don't want to hear it and etc. So um, going about um, this type of research more qualitatively might be one of the ways to understand it. I think particularly when we look at private messaging apps, because you know, sure, um, if you like conflict and if you like uh, difficult heated discussions and polarized discussions, there are plenty of places you could go seek them online. But once those, conver those conversations are getting to you, uh, either through, you know, um, WhatsApp group discussions, family groups, like all these groups that people keep creating and putting you in, like, so how, how does that change, right? Because you're not opting to seek that out. And maybe that's why uh, we didn't really see a lot of differences between WhatsApp and Facebook, because you know, I think on on Facebook, people would maybe um, be less worried about or less affected by those discussions because um, you're either seeking them or you're not. But you know, you don't really care about those people. But when it's you know your family or your friends and groups of people with whom you are communicating and connecting for other reasons, uh, particularly because there is a pre-existing relationship, maybe those are much more uncomfortable. And then it's really hard to study that if not through you know, surveys and self-reports, but also not through focus groups and qualitative work because this data is just not out there. And all, uh, and we don't really see when, especially when we study like the content on, of online discussions and, and online communication. So again, like the, the whole research on incivility, we don't really see who is not there, right? We just don't know yeah, who's yeah. not taking part on those discussions. And, and that I think Me. is where <laughs> I've got a couple of questions in the chat which follow on nicely from that. Um, I am gonna ask people to put their questions in the Q&A again, because it's a bit easier for us to follow them, but um, a couple of questions. One from Stuart Shulman, which I think you said you don't have the data and, and Stuart says, do the platforms that fund your work provide any useful metadata on blocking and unfriending activity? No, very sadly, um, no. So on WhatsApp, um, these WhatsApp grants, like these grants that come as awards, they typically are not associated with any data. Um, so the way that Facebook and WhatsApp mainly fund research through these grants, um, they just give you an unrestricted gift as a grant and, and you know, good luck getting your own data. Um, but um, so no, we don't we don't know. Um, we don't have any data on that. It's only self reports, unfortunately. And also on WhatsApp, um, it seems that they are themselves like their own researchers are quite limited in the types of data they actually have access to uh, that being an encrypted end to end encrypted platform. So not really. Uh, I even had a couple of because like because of the, the award, uh, we kind of get to talk to their own researchers and etc. Sometimes, um, and we had long conversations about you know group sizes and the groups matter and etc. Not even group sizes were a thing that they were comfortable enough to disclose. All they tell us is that most people are not in these big groups. Most uh, nine in ten conversations are one to one, and most people are in groups with fewer than ten, but not not really much more than that. No, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Okay. So, and the second, it's a it is a follow up question, but there's two questions from Gabriella Belli. The first one is just a factual one. Is this report available online in a CSV format? I'm very interested in the data and I'm researching specific attitudes, uh, online attitudes through gender analysis. And there's the question uh, underneath that substantive question um, from Gabriella. What are the gendered aspects of your findings? What would be an impactful next step in gendered research? So is it available? And then um, is there a gendered aspect to the research? Yeah, so um, no, the data set's not available. Um, the paper itself um, that I presented is um, just about to go under review. Um, so it should be available soon, but the data is not available. Um, the, the survey data is not available at the moment. In terms of gender related, uh, gender -related findings, just gonna, going back here, I actually don't think there's anything about gender here. Um, no, there isn't, uh, which was kind of interesting, right? Because there is perhaps an expectation that women would be more likely to withdraw from such conversations. But at least in this data set, we did not find um, 
any evidence that women were more likely either to employ, avoid uh, these conversations. Um, so no, no implications here, um, which is intriguing itself, I guess. I think we're all fired up and, and pissed off. <laughs> okay. Um, so in the Q&A, Patricia, I've got a question here, an interesting question from Yotam Ophir, who asks, can you please talk a bit about how Brazil is similar or different from the rest of the world? So that's a big ask, but okay. Um, in terms of online discourse, and importantly, can it explain the ongoing COVID-19 crisis in Brazil? So it's quite a lot here, uh, <laughs> along, of course, with the rise of populism, etc. Thanks. But I mean, it's a good, you can answer which aspect of that question you want to, to answer. Yeah, no, of course. Um, ah, fun, funny you. Well, um, so Brazil, how similar or different from the rest of the world? Um, I guess currently different just because like, you know, we're now ranking a lot worse by far and wide uh, in all aspects you can possibly imagine, uh, but mainly democratic threats, uh, right, and rise of authoritarianism. Um, but at least in terms of um, the research that I have done, uh, not only this, but also um, looking at content, should we stop? Uh, looking at content of online discussions, um, we tend to find similar uh, patterns than uh, research on the US or uh, comparative research looking at you know several um, European countries tend to find as well. So in terms of like how much instability is out there in Brazil, pretty similar uh, rates, um, how much misinformation is out there tends to be somewhat similar. So um, it doesn't seem like Brazil is a particularly special case of a uh, social media dumpster fire. I think we're all mm -hmm. in that, you know, living hell at the moment. Uh, in terms of the ongoing COVID crisis, I would imagine that all the patterns that um, we have found in this study are probably more heightened, are probably worse, uh, because the COVID-19 uh, crisis in Brazil has been um, not uniquely politically polarized because other countries have had polarized responses. Uh, luckily, Britain has not been one of those, but the US um, was quite polarized in the beginning, right? With very uh, stark divisions um, on both sides from like, how do, you, how do you deal with this? Brazil is a special case in hell because uh, we actually have a president who denies that there is a crisis altogether. Um, so that's, you know, uh, great. Um, so all these patterns are actually worse. Uh, it is just more polarized. Um, it is likely leading to more avoidance um, and deepening all these patterns that we already found. Um, right. Even um, here in Britain, I saw a survey, I think, last year showing that people hated um, those who don't follow the rules more than they hate, the, more than the divisions between you know, remainers and leavers. And I would imagine that to be a similar pattern in Brazil. Like there's, there's pro, uh, pro government and anti-government and those divisions are just deepening uh, as, as we move on. And yeah. particularly with COVID as you know, the death though um, goes up and, peak, and not, not even peaking yet. Um, so it's quite horrible. That's, uh, yeah. that's all to say it's quite horrible. I'm I'm curious how one would go about exactly measuring levels of levels of of hate, but I think that that you know that the takeaway from that um, is, you know, the mistake would be to blame you know levels of how badly it's gone on the social on social media. It is very much a government and public health response, which is the 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 reason behind how badly or how well things have have gone. Um, okay, so um, we've got. Uh, Another question around gender. So I know we've asked you about this already, but um, we're going to ask this one again because it's a it's a, a more you know a, a general question. I think um, anonymous attendee: Do women block or cut social ties online more than men? Psychological literature suggests that men tend to have conflict-oriented and aggressive characters, or more, I guess, than women, which may indicate that men don't mind uncivil, heated, offensive discussions compared to women. So I guess this is asking about what um, research is out there around this more, more generally. Yeah, well, so in our study, we did not find a significant relationship uh, for gender only, um, right? So we did not find any evidence that women would be more likely than men um, to cut social ties or to, uh, to selectively avoid others. I would actually uh, imagine that Perhaps because women don't want, like, might be less inclined to severe ties or harm, undermine relationships for reasons related to politics. That might be one of the, the things that explain. Um, 
the only gender related finding in this literature that I can recall is um, in a study by Leticia Bold looking at US data published in 2016 that found that uh, gender was slightly significant for older men. So older men um, selectively avoid, uh, but but nothing on women. So like it is quite curious because um, you no, know, there are, there is a re there is a lot of research on how women tend to participate less in in political discussions overall, and also obviously that men tend to be a bit more conflict oriented than women. So I would imagine that there are different effects, but they might not be pronouncing in action. So for instance, I would imagine that women might be offended or perceive as an attack. Uh, different behaviors than men do. Um, I would also imagine that that perhaps has to do with the social ties and the types of discussions that they are having. Um, so it is possible that they have different perceptions um, of the behaviors that um, here and here when we talk about like, um, you know, self-reported measures, I talk, we ask, have you felt offended? Like who knows who offends this person, right? So you could imagine that there might be different sensibilities in what offends uh, women versus men, but at least in terms of taking action, we did not find any um, relationship. I haven't looked at like just you know basic um, cross-sectional distributions, and I could look at that. Um, but at least in the multivariate models, um, nothing here. Okay, so uh, Patricia, I saw you were typing an answer to Nasco Miftari. Do you want to finish? There's a very short question, and then I'll read out uh, a question from your colleague Michelle Henning. Yes. Yes. There's one, um, one way we can answer these questions, you see. So. Yes, I'm just trying to pull up the exact dates because it was kind of long. I think it was May and I want to say May and June, but I'm just going to double check. But it was, uh, if I recall correctly, May and June of 2019. No, yes, May to July, actually. So from 21st of May to July 3rd, I will paste that in the box when I find the box. Okay. Okay. Cool. So a question here from Michelle um, uh, from, from Liverpool. I'd like to know your thoughts about avoiding conflict. Oops. I'd like to know your thoughts about avoiding conflict and cutting online ties in order to keep real life friends. For example, I avoid interacting with COVID denier friends because I want to keep their friendship, but I know it is pointless having the argument. Also, how does this relate to the topic? For example, certain kinds of topics where the political difference seems unusually intransigent and or one side or the other feels the other has been brainwashed or certain topics where people fear being negatively classified and publicly shamed. Um, yeah, um, no, this is a great question. Uh, and like sometimes like a personal, personal struggle, um, right? Like how do you stop seeing what horrible things that people that you still love say, um, right? Especially like family members and et cetera. Um, yeah, so um, decades of research looking at political disagreement and why people avoid political disagreement um, kind of suggested that like you know, a lot of relationships that we have are not based on political preferences. We don't pick friends in general based on our politics. And hence we tend to avoid uh, engaging in conversations that we feel might be, um, you know, again, as you said, like kind of pointless uh, because we feel like they might be detrimental to the relationship. So, you now if if we know that um, you know there's a you have a friend who is a COVID denier, or you know if I have a friend who is a Bolsonaro supporter, which is you know my worst nightmare, um, we just don't talk about those things and we keep loving each other uh, as long as we can avoid those topics, right? So yeah, I think it is um, it is what we expect the, the the behavior to be, and which is why it, it, to some extent. It was a bit shocking not to find platform differences because just given the fact that um, you know the people that you talk to on WhatsApp are likely closer friends uh, or or family like you know people that you have the phone so you know not not a John Doe from the street um, the fact that people are just as willing to cut those ties was um, kind of uh, surprising to me because uh, what we were expecting. Um, coming in was that actually people try to avoid um, conversations when they just don't, when they wanna keep the relationships and ignore um, the differences in opinions, right? Cause like, you know, not, not everyone is that politically interested that you can select or has to select your friends based on politics. And a lot of the times, um, you know, there are differences in opinions that, you know, you just didn't know were in place. Like you don't survey people like, what are your opinions on five different topics when you're starting being friends? So. Yeah. Just 
sometimes it's like, you know, you agree to disagree so we can all, you know, keep being friends, I guess. Thanks, Patricia. There's a question here from Sarah McMonagall, which is about the, the group that you're interviewing. And she's interested in knowing if there, if you are, know if there's any differences relating to age. And you mentioned older men, I think earlier, considering the common accusation on political discursive levels that the young are more likely to cancel, does this play out in your data? Um, well, very, very slightly. Um, so we did find that uh, younger people were slightly more likely to quit WhatsApp groups and slightly more likely also to quit Facebook for re reasons related to politics. Uh, and that might have to do with the fact that young people are just like in other pl platforms. So Facebook doesn't really matter that much for them anymore. Uh, but we did not find any age related dynamics for uh, blocking or unfriending on both WhatsApp and, and on Facebook. So no, no real differences for age. Um, the, the young canceling uh, patterns are not really present in, in our data, at least. Just slightly so on quitting uh, WhatsApp, but you know, kind of slightly. Okay, so um, we've got Nasco Miftari here saying, I wanted to know if the survey might have been influenced in any way by Brazil's Supreme Court fake news probe, which took place around the same time. So contextual, oh. contextual influence on the, the survey. Yeah, uh, well, um, it's very safe to say that there hasn't been a single uneventful month in the past, I want to say, five to six years in Brazil for you to say like, let's have a survey and it will be like a normal scenario. Like there hasn't been a normal scenario um, since 2014, really. Um, when we applied for this grant, our hope was to run a survey around the elections. But then by the time that the grant was actually in place, the elections were far gone. And then we just kind of hoped in the middle of the year to just say like, well, okay, you know, generally, in normal times, which is nothing like we have been living in normal times, once a new government is in place, things calm down a little bit, they haven't. Um, in normal times, um, you know, there's gonna be a little of a, of a buffer, um, seeing that people are gonna just kind of withdraw from this that heated politics, didn't happen. So um, yeah, it is possible that, um, that the other dynamics that were happening by the time that we filled the survey could have affected our results. I would imagine that the fake news probe would probably affect um, results related to misinformation and, and, and disinformation that we have in the survey. Uh, then this whole pattern of uh, political discussions or heated political discussions. Uh, but at the same time, like just, there's just no, like if you're doing survey research in Brazil, like good luck, there's just no good time. It's all bad. <laughs> Okay, um, I think I might have um, said that a question was answered when it when it wasn't, but I'm just going to go up to a question here from Nada Chahab, who's asked, "How did you define the scope of the offensiveness of the content? Was, for example, a call for tolerance considered an attack?" Yeah, well, um, the the beauty and also the drawback of uh, using self reports is that we don't know, right? So. Uh, what is offensive is whatever the person responding to the survey thought was offensive to them and being attacked is again like whatever the person perceives to be an attack. I think there are advantages and disadvantages in this approach like uh, the advantage being that um, if incivility and like offensiveness are kind of on the eye uh, of the beholder, right? People have different reactions, different uh, perceptives, uh, perceptions of what is appropriate and what is not appropriate in different contexts, then it's probably a more reliable measure to say like, you know, did you feel offended? Because you know, who knows what offends that person? Or did you feel attacked? Because again, who knows what matters what they feel, right? But then the drawback is that we don't really know what types of behaviors could lead them to feel offended or could lead them uh, to feel attacked, um, right? So if we look at some like work on um, perceptions of incivility, we tend to we tend to see that in general people perceive as more offensive kind of like personal attacks. So like saying, "Oh, you're dumb," instead of saying like this argument is dumb. So people tend to be a bit more tolerant on attacks on on um, on arguments versus attacks on the person. But uh, with the data that we have. Um, I don't know, it's whatever people felt was offensive to them or whatever people felt was attacking to them. Okay, thanks, Patricia. Are you okay to keep going? 
Oh yeah, sure. Okay, all right. So we've got uh, Nicholas John here. Um, interesting, interesting perspective here. Uh, reframing, how would you think about reframing the discussion about unfriending and rather than seeing it as a threat to political de deliberation, conceptualizing it instead as a positive act in service of our well-being? Hmm. Blood, blood pressure question. Yeah. Well, um, hmm. I guess the, 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 um, the answer to that is, you know, we would then have to measure what are the effects, right? Does, does withdrawing from conversations that um, make you feel bad, make you feel offended and et cetera, does that make you happier? Uh, and does making you happier also means that you're not becoming more politically intolerant, right? There's, there's a whole research line on the effects of this that we might, we might have to explore uh, and it's not what we've done here. Uh, I think, you know, on the one hand and the, the line that we took in this paper, um, the line that I kind of tend to take just thinking about, you know, why, why does it matter that we're exposed to uh, the other side is that, you know, if, if you are uh, actively avoiding the other side, it, it typically means that you don't consider their views as legitimate. And if you don't consider their views as legitimate, um, things can only be worse, right? Like the divisiveness will not be bridged if we only uh, turn our backs to each other. But but it is possible that there is a relationship um, with, with well-being and that is not a relationship that I have explored. But I think you know, it is um, probably a very interesting line of inquiry. Uh, and even like one of one of my colleagues in this, um, one of my collaborators in, in this work, uh, who was in Brazil at the time um, mentioned, you know, quitting Facebook uh, for reasons related to politics because she just couldn't, you know, for, for well-being. And sometimes I kind of you know, take take some time off um, some groups on WhatsApp and etc. So like, I think there is something there, but it's not something that um, that I measured. Uh, I guess the question really is like, okay, um, so quitting, like, if we selectively avoid certain types of discussions or certain types of content, that is good for us. But what are then the potentially problematic consequences in terms of how we see the other side, how we see society, how we perceive political difference and et cetera. So like, I, I am very reluctant to say that it is really bad. Um, it can be really good to just withdraw completely from conversations that have disagreement. But I would also at the same time contend that there are conversations and conversations, right? Like if people are shouting at you, they're, uh, their own ideas and they're not inclined to actually have a discussion that is productive, then, you know, Good for you. Like, just get get away from it. Um, right? I think there there certainly needs to be more research on this. I think most uh, of the work so far has been kind of about um, you know first like uh, fil uh, fil filtration of your own feed and and what does that mean? Now that we are starting to look at a private messaging apps, so then close the relationships. Uh, what are the patterns that change? And I think it is a really good suggestion and a very important line of inquiry to think about like you know why why do people do these things and like do they do this for their own well-being or do they just do it because they you know hate the other side like i don't know um great question thanks yeah and i, I guess what what nicholas was getting at was you know something that you raised when you're talking about affordances and the different affordances at different platforms and I guess it's you know it's a question about technology that's been going on for a long time about to what extent those affordances are determining or or quite quite open and I think this is what Mark Shipsides is kind of alluding to and Nicholas Nicholas might be saying you know you you don't have the conversations online but you can have the conversations elsewhere in a different yeah. setting change the scene of the conversation and it has a different meaning so so Mark has said is a lack of physicality part of the problem even with people we know i.e. it's easier to ramp up or walk away when the discussion isn't face to face as opposed to keyboard warrior uh, based. So it's almost like the, the face to face uh, contact requires a, a different ethical approach to the other person. Yeah, possibly. Um, I think I, I think that might possibly be in place, though, again, um, I think. It... Hmm. If like, I guess the problem is like, there's no unfriending uh, face to face, right? Like you don't say like, you know, you don't click off this person. You don't say go away, um, right? So I, I think that the um, detrimental effects of heated conversations that take place face to face um, would perhaps be felt, you know, in, in a post 
post um, situation thing, right? Like you had that conversation with that person, went bad, you just kind of stopped talking for a while. Those those things probably happen. Uh, actually, no, they, they do happen as we know. Uh, but it is quite possible that just like the, the physical constraints of just having that other person in front of you will actually make you be a bit more tolerant or at least provisionally tolerant um, to having the conversation. But uh, on the flip side, um, right, that's also how decades of, of research has suggested to us that people don't really like to engage in disagreements because they'd rather keep their friendships and their social relationships. So, you know, then it's possible that in our face-to-face uh, -face conversations, we just don't expose them ourselves um, to those situations that are uncomfortable and are perhaps easier uh, to withstand um, when we are not doing it face to face. So yeah, for sure, um, being online completely. I just think that the the WhatsApp dynamics are kind of interesting because you know, at least for um, you know for Brazilians for like for texting, right? People who you text are people who you care about um, in general, right? Um, so I would imagine that some of those social constraints of like I don't want to um, I don't want to call this person. Uh, something that I will regret because I'll see them tomorrow at work or, you know, because I'll see them uh, over Christmas. So I think those social constraints would probably be also in place on WhatsApp. And it's a bit surprising that they don't seem to be. So, yeah. Yeah, I think I see one one substantive question left here in the at the bottom from Jessica Mariozzi. Uh, big question. Is there any relationship between fake news and uncivil conversations? Possibly, but not that we uh, tested. Um, we could, in fact, look into this. So the, the core interest of this research was looking at uh, exposure to and engagement with um, false information um, and misinformation. So how do people perceive uh, their WhatsApp feeds or Facebook feeds to be? Um, but it's not something that we investigated um, here. I think the relationship, especially in the case of Brazil, might have to do with uh, the polarized um, nature of, um, of false news, uh, false information that circulates on WhatsApp uh, in particular. So there, there is possibly a relationship, but it's not one that we have investigated. Okay. But thanks for the question. <clears throat> Good. Good. Well, I, I hope we haven't missed anyone. There's a little factual question here left from an anonymous attendee, if you see that. Could you share the links to the Pew Research Report and Ipsos poll in the chat? Um, so if, if you've got the access and yeah, that's, but I think, I think we've caught everyone else in terms of the chat and the, uh, the anything yeah. that I missed? Yeah, I'm just looking at the chat because I haven't looked at the chat that much, let's see. There's a comment from Raquel, but it's not so much a question. It's about um, Bolsonaro. Um, maybe you want to comment on this. It says Brazilian here, Raquel. The problem with political fights and social media is that we're talking about deep human values. Bolsonaro is against minorities and is making COVID-19 pandemics worse here. His supporters are so blind that it is impossible to make them think logically. It's very difficult to talk to them without being attacked. So people end up giving up and blocking each other. And that's a problem. But we must talk so that they can really see the true face, I think, of their idol. It must be face, yeah. Yeah, no, and I think that is um, that is precisely true uh, in, in, in deeply polarized contexts, right? Um, when we get to such levels of polarization where we uh, see the other side as a threat first, which is definitely what happens in Brazil. Like, you know, you're either with Bolsonaro no matter what, and like, and the no matter what is like quite, quite a high bar because he, he is um, a, a disaster uh, in any account you can, you, you, you name it, like any account, right? Like he's been denying COVID for a year now. Like that's not even the, not even the, the, the main COVID deniers in the beginning, like Donald Trump sustained that level of denialism for so long, but no, like he is relentless. Um, I think that the, the problem that we have in very deeply polarized contexts is that um, it, it then becomes almost a matter, like our disagreements are not about issues. They are not about things we can find even provisional agreement. They're not about policies. They're not even about ways of, uh, you know, conducting um, the country. They are actually about, you know, deep moral values. And these agreement about moral values are really hard to overcome, right? There's a fantastic book by Amy Gantman uh, and... Um, 
Dennis Thompson uh, on democracy and disagreement and why it is actually like it is so hard um, to solve some types of disagreements and with the disagreements that are hard to solve and that are not even easy to address uh, in a full blown like deliberative process are the ones that touch our moral values. So problem with um, you know high levels of polarization like we have in Brazil and of uh, politics and, and political divisions that are deeply entrenched with personal identities more than they are with political views and political values and political issues that we care about is that then there is there is no conversation, right? There, there is no way of bridging those moral disagreements because if we fundamentally think that there is one way of doing things that is inherently wrong, there is no basis to bridge those disagreements and there's no basis for a provisional consensus. So yeah, I totally, I totally agree with you um, that it is like sometimes kind of impossible to engage in those types of conversations. But the, and the reason being that they are not conversations about policy, they're not conversations about actions, they're conversations about and, and that deeply affect our own political identities and our own um, personal values and, and moral values in ways that we cannot really bridge and in ways that we cannot really resolve. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, Patricia, you know, you've, you've answered a lot of questions. Uh, you've given a, a great paper. Uh, I think we might, um, we might stop it here. I don't see anything else else coming in. So I'm just going to ask the, the audience to, to thank you again. So applause uh, to, to you. Uh, I want to thank the audience as all as we always do for these these events, because they really do make these events, we always get lots of good questions coming in, whether we're in person or in the chat and the, and, and the Q&A. Um, it was really great uh, to, to meet Chewy just in the corner there, just slightly off, off screen. Um, oh, I'll get Chewy. We're all enjoying meeting the, the pets. OK. Yeah. This is Chewy. And uh, as, as always, you know, uh, you, you, thanked, you thanked Helen at the start. And I want to thank um, Helen and, and Michael at the, at the end as well for, for the organization and for, for running this. Um, so thanks, thanks to both of you. Our next, um, our next talk in this series will come up on the screen in a second. It's, I think, Simran Singh uh, after, after Easter, who's going to be talking about music in, in boxing. Um, so uh, please do come along for, for that one. Thanks again.